So the nanomaterials that we use are basically just very, very small materials. So liposomes are small, fat-based molecules. They're kind of like the cell membrane of a cell in that they've got kind of like a, a bilayer, so two layers of fat molecules that you can put stuff on the inside of or you can stick stuff on the outside of. So the liposomes that get used in the clinic carry cancer-treating drugs. It means it stays in the circulation of the blood for longer, so it gives the drug more of a chance to get to where it needs to go and treat the disease. Because currently, if you just put the drug in, it can often be excre excreted quite quickly from the body. So I work on the brain. The brain is notoriously difficult to get drugs into because of the thing called the blood-brain barrier, which stops drugs and molecules getting through. So we actually directly inject into the brain and what's good about the nanomaterials there is that they stay where you put them. So if we inject into a very small area in the brain, it doesn't start to spread the drug everywhere around the brain. It keeps it where we want it to be. So in this way, you can stop negative side effects. What I primarily work on is Parkinson's disease. So for Parkinson's disease, we use a rat model. So we bring in rats and that are completely normal. We get them in from the company and we can give them Parkinson's disease by just injecting a toxin into the brain which can have an effect on the brain that essentially mimics the symptoms of Parkinson's disease in the animal. So to do this, we anaesthetise the animal, we'll shave a little patch of hair off the top of his head so we can get access to the skull, and we create a small hole in the skull through which we pass a very, very thin needle into the brain. Um, the brain itself doesn't have any nerves for sensing pain, so this part of the procedure isn't painful for the animal, so it's not like when you get an injection through your skin. Mice and rats are prey animals, so they don't tend to shout out to the world that they're in pain like maybe we would if you know you bump your toe so they tend to try and keep quite quiet and they don't squeak about it but we can tell by looking at their um, different features so often they'll like scrunch up their noses and um, their fur will bristle a bit and they'll tend to kind of hunch up in the corner they won't really want to be handled and if you open the lid of the cage they won't be kind of investigating what's going on they tend to be a bit quite quiet but luckily with the surgery that i do with the animals we don't tend to have these symptoms afterwards in general just one injection of the painkiller at the end of the surgery gets them through the bit just after surgery where they might be a bit stressed and then after that they recover and they're usually eating and running around within an hour so they're happy out. We only give them Parkinson's in one half of their body so that means that the animal can eat, can run around, can groom his cage mates as normal but we can still see some behavioural outcomes in the animals that tell us whether he's got Parkinson's disease and then when we give the treatment that we're interested in we can follow up on his behaviour and see if those symptoms get better and see if he starts to go back to a more normal um, behaviour or if he stays with the Parkinson's symptoms. So the rat model is in some ways very similar to the human model and in a lot of ways very different. So the biggest difference obviously being that humans wouldn't get Parkinson's in only one half of their body. But one of the other things is that in humans it's a slow progressive disease. So certain cells start to die. We still don't know why these cells start to die but they start to die in a very specific part of the brain. This has kind of far-reaching effects within the brain that cause the slow progression of the symptoms that we see with Parkinson's disease. And this tends to spread through different brain areas. Whereas with the rats, what we're doing is we're mimicking this, but in a very quick fashion. So we tend to kill the same cells, but in, you know, overnight. So the, the rats will start to develop symptoms kind of within a day or two. They'll already have the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So what this model isn't great for is telling us how the disease starts but the downstream symptoms of it are still quite similar to what we would see in humans in that they've got the evidence of tremors, they've got this difficulty starting movements, which is one of the big problems with Parkinson's. So when we're checking to see whether or not the animal has Parkinson's disease, there's a couple of different behavioural tests that I use. So one of the most widely used tests for Parkinson's is called a cylinder test. So essentially you get a rat and you put him inside a glass cylinder and the natural behaviour of a rat when you put him in a new environment is to stand up on his back legs and put his paws on the glass wall and have a sniff, have a look around and see what's going on. So when we do this, we count them a number of times. He uses his left paw or his right paw to balance himself. And then in that way, we can count and see how much he's using those different paws. When we give them the Parkinson's disease, we inject the toxin into the right hand of their brain and they should lose the movement in their left side. So at this stage, what we generally see is that they don't use their left paw at all when for balancing themselves. They only use their right paw. A similar test, which I think the rats quite enjoy, is the cocoa pop test. So we essentially put them in a little corridor with cocoa pops in cups on either side, and we just let them walk up and down and eat as many cocoa pops as they want within, say, five minutes. And we can count whether or not they're eating more cocoa pops from the right-hand side versus the left-hand side. And again, after we give them the Parkinson's, they should decrease the amount of cocoa pops they eat from their left hand side so you'll see they'll walk up and down the corridor and they'll only pick food from the right hand side and then they'll turn around 
we'll only pick food from the right hand side again. So again, it's quite a simple measure that gives us quite uh, robust results in terms of whether or not they actually have lost the use of their left hand side. So now we've got the model established for the animals that we can get rats that have Parkinson's disease. This means we can start to try and deliver treatments into the brain. So one area that we're particularly interested in is a small brain area that becomes very overactive during Parkinson's, which sounds quite counterintuitive considering it's a loss of movement, but actually this area becomes overactive and it kind of stops everything else from working correctly. So what we want to do is get to this small area. In humans, you use something called deep brain stimulation, which is an electrode that you put into this area. You put out an electrical signal and it quietens down the area. We want to see if there's a way that we can just inject something one time leave the brain, take the needle out. We don't have to leave an electrode in so it's less traumatic. Um, and in that way, still quieten down the same area. So we're looking at gene therapies for doing this. So instead of just being able to inject a gene therapy, which the body would kind of degrade really quickly, we are trying to stick it to the outside of our nanomaterials to see if it can protect it, if it can keep it in the small brain area and stop it spreading around and then still see the desired effect that we're interested in.